Hey, hey, we're saints. Good morning. God bless and keep all of you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. I'm going to jump in right into it today. No cute little stories or jokes because I want to talk about something serious that I think probably every person that ever is, was, and shall be struggles with or goes through at some point in their life. And it is that feeling when, when we go from, I'm in a good place in my relationship towards God and abiding by His commandments and living as a Christian to a less than good place kind of where we might feel that estrangement from God. You may even say to yourself, you know, I'm just not on the right place in my spiritual life. I'm kind of off. I feel like somehow I've I've not given myself like I'm supposed to. I'm not doing the things I'm supposed to. And and I just don't have that feeling of estrangement. And when we get in that moment where we know we're not right with God, we tend to say to ourselves, well, I'm, I'm bad. It's because I'm a wretched sinner. Well, we probably are. But these are the things we say to ourselves. And then it goes worse into, you know, despair, to despondency. And that feeling of being estranged, somehow not in the right place with God, that we find ourselves in the spiritual desert, where we might feel lost out there in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. I don't know if any of you have experienced that. I know that I've gone through it in my life, and I know that many of us do. I, I, uh, you know, we hear this a lot. It's not uncommon to hear in the sacrament of confession. So I was, I think about it. The thing that we tend to say is, you know what? I'm bad. It's, it's because I'm somehow a sinner and I'm off. I've not done the right things that I need to do or the place that I am supposed to be. But the more I think about it, what if we looked at it entirely differently? What if it wasn't that that estrangement or that that dissonance that we feel is not necessarily a bad thing, but actually a good thing? What if that feeling is a sign that somehow we are doing the right things? That somehow we have engaged not in a spiritual life, but we have engaged in a spiritual warfare. Because indeed... This life actually is a war. It is not something that is just, you know, that somehow if we love God or we dedicate our life to God, that somehow everything's going to be rosy and peachy or holy all the time. It's a battle, man. It's a fight. And we all know that just by living our lives, that there is a constant bombardment, an assault, an attack of things coming at us from every single direction. And so we are starting to look rather than I'm falling that indeed this is a good sign. I am engaged in a war. I have entered the arena. Now interesting to note too, where did this war come from? You started it. Wait, Father Chris, what are you talking about? What do you mean I started it? Look, in your baptisms, each and every one of you, you spit upon the devil, right? Or your godparents did that on your behalf. We stand at the back of the church and we renounce the devil and we spit upon him. I don't know if that's, if that's not a sign of war, I don't know what is, right? And so we have to expect that that war is something that we began. I'm going to tell you a great story, one of my most favorite stories from the monastic tradition. It's about a, a monk named Abba Dorotheos. He's from 5th century, 6th century in Palestine. And a young monk comes to him and says, Abba, I long to be with Christ. I'm fighting hard to be with Christ, to be a good Christian. Why is the devil making war against me? To which Abadoro Theos responds, the fact, listen carefully, it's on your screens, the fact that you are being made war against is a sign that you are first making war. You understand that? If we are not striving to live a Christian life, the devil has no need to waste his time for us, on us. He's already winning. But the moment that we decide, I will be someone who, who strives to live a crucifixional life, baby, he's coming. And you started it, right? And I consider that to be a good thing. In fact, I consider that to be a great thing, as we'll see when we get to our practical points. You may be saying to yourself at this point, but Father Chris, like, I'm not a warrior, right? Like, I, I'm, I mean, I'm not like this holy monk, Abadoro Theos, or like good men and women, or, you know, people in life. I'm just, I'm some guy or some gal. Oh, really? For all of those of us who were baptized in the Orthodox Church and those who shall be, there is a prayer that follows after the immersion, after the chrismation, we hear the following. And again, you'll see it on your screens. He or she 
who has put on thee, O Christ our God, bows also his head with us unto thee. Make him a warrior invincible of every attack that assails him and us. We are asking God in baptism to make this child, to make this person who is baptized a warrior to fight against all of the powers of darkness and evil. Do you understand that? It is not that we are running around in a rosy life. Maybe we started a war and the enemy is formidable. And his desire is to take us away from Christ so that we might live further away from the Lord, further away from life. And so in order to overcome that by God's grace and God's mercy, we must become warriors. That's why we use the metaphor of St. George about being a warrior saint. Because we are fighting for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not against power in the world, but against power in the next life, which is to come. So again, now that we understand that we have been set to that task, we are all called to be warriors. You might be asking yourself, all right, well, what weapon do I use? I don't know how to fight this, right? Like, I mean, is it a sword or an axe? I mean, do we use guns? I mean, what are we talking about? All right, to answer that question... I want to go to the gospel that we just heard read for us this morning. Now Jesus, and this is the, a famous passage, perhaps one of the most famous passages in the gospel of John. Jesus says that just as Moses in the wilderness lifted up the serpent, so too must the Son of Man be lifted up. And if you're savvy, you can start to hear where Christ is going with this statement, but we'll see it at the end. But what's that Moses stuff? What's that Moses serpent stuff? My, my, under, my gut says that many of us don't know what, what John is talking about when he writes this. To understand what he's talking about Moses in the wilderness, we have to go all the way back to the book of Numbers in chapter 21. And in Numbers 21, this is when Moses is leading God's people through the wilderness, right? And they're on their 40-year exodus. And he's given them water from a rock and bread from heaven. And he's given them quail from heaven. He's defended them against their armies and so on. He's given them life. And then all of a sudden in chapter 1, we hear this thing the people spoke against Moses and against God. And they said, why did you bring us out of Egypt so that we might die in the wilderness? We have no food. We have no water. And this heavenly bread, it's awful. <laughs> right? Like you can hear it, they're whining against God. We, we were in Egypt as slaves. You brought us out to die in the wilderness. What's going on? And God says, oh, really? So he decides to send fiery serpents among the people. And the serpents bite them. And when they get bit, they die. Which immediately, immediately leads the people to say, uh-oh, what have we done did? Right? So they go back to Moses and they say, uh, we sinned against God and against you. Um, these serpents, there's a problem. Please pray to God that he might save us from them. And so Moses prays to God. To which God responds, all right, fine. We got him hopefully a little bit back in check. I want you to make a fiery serpent and put it on a pole so that when they get bit and they look at it, they will be saved. They will live. So Moses makes a fiery serpent and he puts it on a pole. And when anybody gets bit by these serpents that are running around amongst them, they live. Right? So God in this story through Moses lifts up. It's not about a serpent. It's not about even the pole. It's that whatever God is giving to them is lifted high and they can see that. And that grants life over the monsters of the snakes. Do you follow? Now, let's jump back to the gospel. Jesus Christ tells us, and this is probably one of the most famous verses in all of Scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that all who believe in him will not perish, actually the word in Greek, to be destroyed, but will have eternal life. Now, this is a famous verse, and I know that you love to write it on posters and take it to football games and hold it up. Because God loves us. Indeed, he does. But the point of this verse is not that God loves us. That's part of it. The point... The message that John is driving home is that he loved us so much that he gave his son for us. Do you understand that? And you're all Americans. You don't understand what that means for a father who's a Semite to give his only son. And for a bunch of sinners no less. Right? That's powerful. It's stunning to think about that. That God gave us his son. And not to hang out and play golf with. He gave us his son so that he might be lifted up upon the cross. And on that cross, as we sing at Pascha every year, he tramples down death by his death. You see it. It's stunning. It's so ridiculously beautiful what God has done for us by giving us his, his son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and lifting him upon the cross to conquer the greatest of all the monsters, death itself. 
And so that when we see Christ lifted up upon the cross, we know that this is the instrument, this is the tool, the weapon of our victory over all of those monsters, particularly in our lives, sin and death. And so the message now comes all the way back, first circle, full circle for us, is that we must choose to live a crucifixional life. That's our duty. That is our responsibility. That is the way that we engage in this war. It is not a conventional war like the world fights. It is a very different kind of war. And the stakes are our very souls, our very lives in this life and in the next. And we've seen that what God lifts up through Moses and the serpent, and then again, most importantly, through his son on the cross, monsters are slain. The enemy is vanquished. You see it. This is unbelievable. And so the challenge for each and every one of us is that we must set ourselves to the task of living a Christ-like, we say, crucifixional life. I promise you this. Just as Christ conquered death and sin by his cross, so too might every one of us conquer whatever sins are in front of us if we live a similar life. It's not always easy to do that, I know. I know there are a lot of things that get in the way. We're talking about our blockers now, especially those things we started with at the beginning, right? That somehow I fell off the horse of my spiritual life, right? And that that leads to the idea that I'm bad, which leads ultimately to despair or depression, despondency, suffering, which ultimately leads us to that dry and dark place, the desert, the spiritual desert. I'm going to tell you something funny. Our first practical point, we have to recognize that that spiritual desert It is a natural outcome of being engaged in the spiritual war. You cannot assume, I hope you don't assume, that once you dedicate yourself to living a crucifixional life, that everything's going to be perfect. Actually, the opposite. And those of us who have dedicated ourselves to Christ know very much that it's not always perfect, right? We have to recognize that this is actually part of the process. And it's like, you're no longer in peewee football, baby. You're no longer in JV. You've graduated. Come on, we're on the varsity level. And guess what? Someday, through God's grace and our hard work, we might get to college and the pros. Do you understand that? Each point of, uh, of our life, of our journey, we graduate, if you will, from one level to the other. And the battles get harder. We're not children anymore. We're not eating milk, drinking milk. We're eating solid food, <clears throat> the solid food of the gospel. Anticipate and be thoroughly, listen to this, excited about all of those challenges that come before us. Let me tell you. When you start to suffer through this this desert, I love it. Not because as your spiritual father, I want to see you suffering. Obviously not. I I wish your life would be perfect. But I love it because it tells me something. You aren't sitting on the sidelines. You aren't just allowing the devil to win the easy battles. You're fighting. And when you fight and strive to live that kind of life, honey, he's going to bring it. And so when I see him bringing it, I, I weep for your pain, but I rejoice over your commitment to the gospel. It makes me happy. Because I know that my spiritual son or spiritual daughter is in the fight. You've entered the arena. Practical point number two. When I tell you to look at the cross, I don't need you to come here and look at the icons all day long. That's not going to do anything for you, right? You should have the icons at home, say your prayers. But to look at the cross of Christ means that becomes the modus operandi through which we live our lives. So that every single thing we do, here, there, or anywhere, we're doing so in a Christ-like fashion. Are you working hard? Do it crucifixionally. You married? Do it crucifixionally. You have children? Raise them crucifixionally. Do you have businesses or jobs or careers? Be honest and in integrity and do it with a crucifixional mindset. Are you in your relationship with people out there? Maybe people who we might be fighting with who are irritating to us or we may have irritated. Be crucifixional and apologize. Sacrifice. Do you feel like quitting? Be crucifixional, baby, and go one more step. Fight through all of this. Do you understand? Crucifixional living is not something that we we do at this moment or that moment. It's not one more thing to do, right? You hear me say this all the time. Being crucifixional is not one more thing to add to your life. Being crucifixional is a new way of doing entirely everything. So that the filter through which I look at the world is the cross of Christ. So that in whatever I'm doing, I am sacrificing myself for the sake of another. Just as our Lord was lifted high on the cross to conquer death, we must do the same. Which leads finally to practical point number three. It's hard. Sometimes it's hard and we don't want to. I often don't want to. 
those temptations to just go soft on it. It happens to me too. It really does. But don't you ever quit. We are not called to perfection in this life, despite what anybody says. Only God is perfect. We know that. We are, however, called to persistence. If you fall, you get back up. When it's hard, you get back up. When it's easy, thank God, and get back up and keep going. Whatever we do when we are living a Christ-like life, you must anticipate, my beloved, that there will be moments where you will fall, where you will stumble, where it will feel hard, where you will find yourself in the middle of that spiritual desert. Great. It's awesome. It's a sign to me you're on the right path. Just keep going. I'll end it like this with this little metaphor. You know, if you're in the middle of the desert, you're, you're walking through the desert, and you're in a dry and waterless place, and you're thirsty. Like hell. It feels like hell. But if you stop, you're in the middle of hell. But you know that on the other side of the, of the desert, there's an oasis with water. Life-giving water. Just keep going. It's hard. I get it. But you can stop. You can die in the desert of thirst, in the heat, or you can fight through and be crucifixional and find that life-giving water on the other side. I know that you know what the right answer to do is. I know that it's, it's simple in our minds to understand that. What you do with that in your lives, how you choose to live your life, that's entirely up to you. But I promise you, I'm telling you the stakes are so high. This is not a spiritual life. This is a spiritual war. And the devil is seeking to claim your souls, brothers and sisters. That is worth a fight. Our, our eternity spent with Christ, it is worth a fight. Let us be warrior saints. Let us wield the weapon of the cross of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which conquers all the monsters, whether it be serpents of the wilderness or sin and death itself. And if you do this, we might have the opportunity of life everlasting, success in this life, and life everlasting in the next. May our great God and Savior Jesus Christ bless and keep you. Amen.